Where in the world is Keith Richards today on a very odd caster? Welcome again to the ninth episode of this fall season of A Very Odd Caster. Where in the world is Keith Richards? Today we're going to focus a little bit on one of my favorite rock and rollers on the planet, the great Keith Richards. Um, what made me think of this was all these great memes that are out there about Keith. Here's one right here that came out at the beginning of the pandemic. See the stones there, uh, yucking it up, arms around each other. They're all wearing masks, except for Keith. And of course, Keith uh, will last the longest. And sadly, Charlie Watts uh, is no longer with us. Um, and here's another meme that I turned up recently that really got me thinking about this as a concept for a very odd caster. This is Keith uh, and his first pet, <laughs> a baby dinosaur. Um, so obviously the, the joke is that Keith is one of the hardest partying rock and rollers of history and he's pushing I guess 80 years old right now and he's still rocking and he's had a lot of uh, bouts with addiction. He's had a lot of bouts with jail time, uh, drug busts, etc. He is the classic rock and roller. There was a book that I read when I was a teenager written by a, a guy named Tony Sanchez, who was, I believe he was a publicist. He, he was part of the Stones entourage. This was a book written in the early 70s. And he was documenting Keith's addiction. And he was claiming in this book that before they could get into another country, like when they would go on tour, all these countries would not let him in because of his drug record and because he had such a strong addiction with heroin, he would get essentially blood transfusions right before they hit the road to clean out his blood. And that was kind of interesting. It also apparently is a myth because Keith himself in his own book said that's bunk as they say in England but Keith Richards is the man uh, I'm a big Stones fan I saw the Stones live I'm a bigger Beatles fan and believe it or not there are lots of us out there who like both groups but there are some who you know kind of divide their turf battles but the Beatles are my favorite group but the Stones kind of filled that that void because the Beatles had that image of being squeaky clean even though they weren't um, and it was just a marketing thing the four lovable mop tops and the stones came in uh, to counter that with the, the bad boy image um, and certainly they were no saints I don't think but they probably were no uh, uh, worse off in terms of behavior than the Beatles um, or any rock and rollers. So Keith is a badass. To me, he's one of the greatest uh, rock and roll guitarists in history. He doesn't get a lot of credit for that. You don't see his name pop up with the great guitar players. You always hear Hendrix, you hear Clapton, you hear um, you know Stevie, uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, and many others, Prince even. Yes, uh, you hear a lot of uh, Eddie Van Halen. All these guys are uh, virtuosos, but you never hear Keith mentioned in that group. And I think his raw, you know, style of playing is great. It, it fits the Stones' uh, sound perfectly. Um, and, you know, yeah, he may not be the virtuoso that some of those other guys are, but he's still, to me, one of the greatest. 
Um, and anyone who writes a song called Tits and Ass has got my vote. So, but t today we're going to explore Keith as, uh, you know, the survivor. Um, and looking at these memes that are exaggerated, I started thinking about this concept of Keith as like this Forrest Gump-like character who, you know, Forrest Gump, of course, uh, over the course of his life, was always a part of history, you know, and uh, he was always there at these pivotal moments in history, and a lot of times uh, he had an impact. And I thought, I, maybe, wouldn't that be something if you had, like, uh, a, a remake of that movie with a slightly more expanded plot, and you had Keith Richards as Forrest Gump. And since Keith seems to survive anything, I'd say why not start at the very beginning and uh, the Garden of Eden, the biblical book of Genesis. And maybe Keith was there at the Garden of Eden, you know. I mean, I think it was, I'm not a biblical scholar, but I think it was part two or book two or not book two, chapter two of, of Genesis where they're talking about all the wild animals on the Garden of Eden, and Adam was uh, given preferred status, of course, and he got to name all these wild animals. Hey, that looks like a lion. Oh, oh there's a tiger. Hmm. You know, and maybe one came along and said, oh, hey, that's Keith Richards. You know, so, so, who knows, maybe Keith was there at the Garden of Eden. Um, you know, maybe, or maybe uh, during the period of the Roman Empire, maybe Keith was there somehow during all that period with uh, Julius Caesar's reign. Uh, maybe Keith was Caesar's chariot driver. Where are you going? I'm your chariot driver. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Of course, Keith is a Brit. And I don't really know British history that well. Um, but at some point, the royal family had to begin, right? I mean, it wasn't, you know, King Charles and Eve back in the Garden of Eden, right? At some point, the British Empire began, and I don't know that, I admit it. And I was too lazy to look it up. Not too lazy, I just didn't have enough. I just did not have enough time, okay? So sue me. But who knows, maybe Keith Richards was the first royal. We don't know that, you know, and he might really be troubled by what's going on with Harry and Meghan these days. I know I am. But by the way, did you see the pictures of Meghan on that uh, game show with Howie Mandel? But hey, since I don't know British history, I can't really put Keith in all the appropriate places in British history. So I'll stick with American history. Um, maybe Keith, uh, well, this is sort of a crossover between British history and American history. Maybe during the American Revolution, when Paul Revere went on his famous ride, his midnight ride to warn the colonists of the coming of the British army, Maybe Keith was there, you know? Maybe Keith was Paul Revere's uh, farrier, you know, working on Paul Revere's horse to get him prepped for that midnight run. And had Keith not been there, maybe Paul Revere's horse would have broken down. And who knows what would have happened? Who knows if we would have ever had the stones? Right? Maybe Keith was around for the American Civil War. Maybe he was uh, Ulysses Grant's drinking buddy. I could see that. Yes, who knows? Keith could have been everywhere during history. What about the Titanic when that sunk back in 1912? Maybe Keith was on the Titanic and he swam to shore and survived. And he swam to shore with his cigarette in his mouth. Mm, writing songs as he's swimming, you know, laughing at Leo DiCaprio as he passed by. Or maybe he
turned on his back and started doing the backstroke and started singing Celine Dion's My Heart Will Go On. My heart will go on. No. Or maybe Keith Richards was around during Prohibition in the 1920s, right? You know, maybe Keith was a, a bootlegger. Maybe Keith smuggled moonshine to various uh, speakeasies across the country. I could see that. Um, you know, World War II. Uh, let me think. Oh, of course, this kind of fits in with the meme theory. Maybe Keith was a street vendor in Nagasaki when the bomb went off. And uh, Keith said, what's going on? <laughs> and here he is still. So yeah, I could see Keith Richards being around at any point in history. When you get to the 1960s, of course, he and the Stones were making history. So I'm not sure that that uh, would work in a meme so much. But uh, you always wonder, maybe some other, other moments in history, maybe in sports history, now, again, I don't know, like, the whole uh, European football history. I'm sure there's some good examples there. But there's been plenty of American sports moments that I could see Keith uh, uh, being there and being a part of in sort of a Forrest Gump-like um, fashion. Like, uh, for example, uh, in the early 70s, there was that Super Bowl between the... Uh, Washington Redskins and the Miami Dolphins. Is Dolphins offensive to anybody? I don't. And uh, it was a fairly close game. That was the season that the Dolphins went undefeated, a pure 17 and 0. But it was a pretty close Super Bowl. But of course, there is that moment that still is shown where the Dolphins lined up to kick a field goal with their kicker Garo Uprimian who was not from Kansas, not sure where he was from, Eastern Europe, I believe. But Garo Uprimian was one of the first soccer style kickers in the NFL. Now they're all soccer style kickers. But he was one of the first, he was a really good kicker, a real little guy. And you know, he lined up and uh, the kick got blocked and the Redskins uh, defensive player, a guy named Mike Bass, I believe, picked the ball up and ran whatever it was, 70 yards for a touchdown, uh, which was Washington's only score of the game. And Garo Upremian, five foot three, 120 pounds, was chasing him down the sideline. Come back, come back. No, I don't know. I don't know what he was saying, but it was kind of funny looking. Oh, I almost forgot. No, that was what happened was the kick was blocked. Upremian picked it up and tried to pass it. And he's this, European soccer guy, and he went, and the ball rolled off his, and he kind of looked like uh, the Browns. But <clears throat> anyhow, how does this fit into the Keith Richards, Forrest Gump thing? Well, maybe, just maybe, Keith Richards was Gero Upremian's holder on that kick. You know, he's there with his cigarette in his mouth, eh, 42, 75. <laughs> 69 sounds like a good number. Hike! Ball comes. Whoops, he fumbles it. Upremian uh, gets the ball and has his moment, which is one of the classics on YouTube. So check it out, people. Check out the 1972 Miami Dolphins Super Bowl against Washington and Garo Upremian's kick, uh, where he tries to uh, throw this pass and it turns into a Washington touchdown. Um, I think Keith Richards was the holder on that play. I really do. Keith also could have been there during the 1986 World Series, the infamous Game 6 uh, between the New York Mets and the Boston Red Sox. And of course, at that time, Boston had not won a World Series in like 80 years or something like that, 70 years. I um, mean, the curse and all that garbage. But... Uh, as I recall, Boston was up three games to two in game six, and they were leading game six uh, by, I think, one run. Uh, 
if I recall correctly. And the Mets were up and they had runners at second and third. And there's two outs. So the Red Sox were one out away from breaking the curse and winning the World Series. And Mookie Wilson, uh, the name alone just says it all, came up to bat for uh, the Mets. And Mookie hits his weak, easy ground ball right to first base. And of course, this goes down in history as the Bill Buckner play. That's a loud ass truck out there. So Bill Buckner was the first baseman, but what if it wasn't Bill Buckner, people? What if the first baseman for the Boston Red Sox in game six of the World Series in 1986, what if the Boston Red Sox first baseman was not Bill Buckner, but was Keith Richards? You ever think about that? He's out there with a cigarette. Hey, batter, batter, come on, let's go, mate. Hit the ball to me. Mookie hits the ball, and then Keith starts hallucinating, and the ball doesn't go through his legs. It just rolls on into right field because Keith is chasing an imaginary ball into foul territory down along the, the stands. Come back here, little ball. Come back here, little ball. And the Mets uh, score the tying, and then the winning run. Um, and, you know, I think that's a plausible bit of uh, history revisionism. Plenty of sports moments in history uh, could have been influenced by Keith Richards. Um, now this one is in the 60s. The Stones had, well, they hadn't quite hit in, in America, but they were already big in England. Uh, this was the uh, 19, no, oh, actually, excuse me, they had just hit in, in the United States. It was right around the time of Satisfaction, which was their big breakthrough. But it was the second Cassius Clay, Sonny Liston fight. So Cassius Clay, of course, to you youngsters, uh, was Muhammad Ali before he had changed his name. Cassius had shocked the world the year before um, and beaten Sonny Liston. And he had actually... Uh, gotten together with the Beatles for a photo op while he was training for the Liston fight. Um, that was what I was thinking of. The Stones were big over in England at, during the first fight, but by the time Clay and Liston had their rematch a year later, the Stones, I think, were starting to make a name for themselves uh, internationally. But uh, so Cassius Clay fought Sonny Liston in the rematch, and the fight lasted about 65 seconds and Clay knocked out Liston with one punch but the problem was nobody saw the punch and if you look at the film it's like where was the punch in fact it was known as the phantom punch you know and a lot of people thought because Sonny Liston uh, had mob ties there were ties to organized crime a lot of people thought he threw that fight just to get a payday to pay, maybe to pay off some, some debts he owed to the bosses, if you will. Uh, but at any rate, it was very suspicious. Liston went down and just lied there. And it was a very, very suspicious thing. And it was known as the phantom punch. Well, maybe it wasn't a phantom punch. Maybe Keith Richards ran into the ring and punched Sonny Liston. Plausible? And of course, Keith Richards could have made his mark in any one of several NBA finals. Uh, the one I'm thinking of, being a suffering Cleveland fan, was the infamous game a few years back between the Golden State Warriors and the, the Cleveland Cavs uh, when uh, J.R. Smith thought that uh, the Cavs were winning with like four seconds left. And in fact, it was a tie game. And there was a missed free throw by George Hill. Thanks, George. But he missed the, the go-ahead free throw. J.R. Smith gets the rebound with like nine seconds left. And inexplicably, instead of trying to go up with the shot and win the game, he starts dribbling down towards the other end of the court because the knucklehead thought the Cavs were winning. So 
And LeBron James, who is nothing if not demonstrative with his bad body language, was like, <laughs> you know. Uh, and so the game went to overtime, and guess what? Golden State won, and they wound up sweeping that series. Um, that was an opportunity the Cavs had to steal a game. They weren't going to win that series, but it was just one of those things. And J.R. Smith, you know, lots of memes about J.R. Smith, but maybe, just maybe, Keith Richards was the scorekeeper at that game. You don't know, right? He's everywhere. He's forever. And uh, he's an all-time great man. Go Keith. Uh, you little tits and ass, you. For that matter, uh, Keith could be a, a poll watcher in any of these elections we got going on these days. Um, by the way, it is, uh, as of this taping, it is now two days after the midterm elections, and we still don't know what the hell is going on, right? This is how many elections now in a row that the days go by and nobody knows what the hell is going on? That's not a good look, all right? Um, now, it may just be that everything is so close that the margins of victories for either side are so tantalizingly close that it takes this long. I don't, I can't quite accept that though because it's 2022, right? We've got all this technology, everything's electronic, computerized. These results should go right through. How is it that you know, 20, 30 years ago, 40, whatever, you know, people would go to bed often knowing what the hell happened in the election. And definitely by the time they woke up, they knew what the hell had happened. But why is it now with all this technology and all these uh, new ways to vote, we don't know what the hell is going on. Um, once again, if it looks like a skunk and it smells like a skunk, it's a... Oh! I no longer have a waiver. Oh, we're not allowed to talk politics here on a very odd cast. Here on a very odd caster. At least we're not allowed to mm, suggest things. I know nothing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm trying to shake a cold here. I think it's a cold. There's no reason for me to believe otherwise. But in this day and age, you never know, right? But yeah, a week ago, we can change, I guess. I started sneezing a lot, and first I didn't know because, you know, the leaves are falling, and there's a lot of precipitation in cool weather and sometimes I can get the allergies. But then, sure enough, I started really sneezing. I said, eh, I'm getting a cold. So I hit it with zinc, right? And that could be a word from our make-believe sponsor. But yeah, I hit it with zinc, um, the zinc gummies that I had purchased. And, um, you know, I've done this before. Years ago, there was a lot of uh, evidence that zinc had a positive impact on uh, the common cold, basically for shortening the duration, which is kind of the, the most important thing. Because a cold is like, eh, yeah, it's not great, but it's not, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world. And uh, the problem is that colds tend to go on forever. You know, they go on in several days and oftentimes a couple weeks. And so I started hitting it right away with zinc and they say you gotta get it right away. And literally two days later, I was done sneezing. And I'm like, wow, you know. But then a few days, I kept taking the zinc. And then a few days later, I still kind of had the, you know, the sniffles and whatnot. So it doesn't totally knock it out, but I do believe there's some therapeutic value in it. Um, however, it leaves a real uh, taste in your mouth, really dry, and it can get to your stomach too. 
So, buyer beware. Um, so I'm gonna think about that, but that could be a word from our make-believe sponsor today. We were talking a lot about sports history uh, in our Keith Richards, where in the world is Keith Richards segment. Um, now I'm gonna turn to real-time sports, kind of what's going on now. Of course, the Houston Astros won the World Series uh, last week, knocking off the upstart Philadelphia Phillies in six games. Uh, Houston always had more talent. That was apparent. You know, they had the second best record, I think, of any team in the playoffs, whereas the Phillies had the worst record of any playoff team. The Phillies were so hot, and I think I predicted that they would win once that series was tied to, to a piece. So, of course, my endorsement was the kiss of death uh, for, the, for the Phillies, but they had a great year. <clears throat> and the Astros, well, you know, they've got a tainted history because of their uh, cheating scandal a few years back. Uh, but they're a very talented team, and, and ultimately talent won out. As a matter of fact, they, had won, they won four games to two, but if you recall in game one, they blew a five-run lead late, and the Phillies stole that game. Um, and so really, Houston could have won four to one, you know, but they're obviously the better team. Congratulations to the folks in Houston, Texas. Um, the NFL continues to uh, unimpress with all the mediocrity there. Um, the Ravens, as I had predicted, they would win the North and the AFC. They seem to be hitting their stride. Whether it's too soon to be hitting a stride is a whole other story, uh, but they're, they're definitely, they've taken control of that division. Um, and the big news or concern if you're a Buffalo Bills fan is Josh Allen's elbow. They say he sprained his UCL which is the uh, uh, Tommy John ligament. And, you know, a sprain is one thing, but if he were to tear that and have to have Tommy John surgery, he's out a long time. And there goes the Super Bowl hopes for the Bills. And they laid a clunker against the Jets. The Jets keep surprising me. I, I may need to take back what I said about them. Back when they beat the Browns in that ridiculous game. Uh, I showed no love for the Jets, but I think they've improved, you know. Um, and so, even though they got that QB who likes banging older women, well, who does it? So if Josh Allen's out an extended period of time, uh, the Bills' chances take a hit. Although if he's back and healthy for the playoffs, I uh, don't you know, they'll still be a contender. Um, the Packers seem like they're done. I don't really know. I can't believe that just losing one great wide receiver uh, meant that much, but it really looks like they're uh, sinking and about to hit sort of, uh, you know, this period where they're mediocre for the next few years because obviously Aaron Rodgers is up there in age and he's looking very average when he doesn't have the, the weapons around him. And obviously Tom Brady uh, is also looking his age out there, very slow, um, you know, but he did have quite a comeback there against the Rams. That was pretty cool. I just don't think there's going to be that many more of those in the Tom Brady highlight reel. Uh, and mainly it's because his whole team looks like they're 45. They're just slow and plodding, you know. So, yeah, I think I picked them to win the division, but somebody will win with an 8-9 and nine record. One of these years we're going to have all the divisions finish with equal records of like 8-9. and nine. And by the way, that 17th game bugs the hell out of me. Keep it at an even number. It's just, this, it's just, I hate it. 
Um, it's not a fair thing because that means you have to play an extra team from out of the conference and it really depends who you draw. If you draw one of the best teams in the other conference and one of your division rivals draws one of the worst teams uh, as their extra game, how is that slightly fair? It's stupid, you know. But no one ever accused the NFL of having any brains, correct? And last but not least, uh, there's this odd case of the Isaiah Thomas, Michael Jordan rivalry. Of course, those two guys were bitter rivals back in the day when Jordan was on the Bulls, uh, making their ascent in the NBA. And Thomas was on the bad boy Detroit Pistons. And if you ever watched any of those games, it was like a rugby match, right? I mean, they were just the cheapest, cheapest players ever. But Jordan was kind of a whiner too, you know. Obviously, I'm a Cavs fan, so you think I like either of those teams? Um, but it was kind of a interesting uh, interview that Isaiah Thomas did on some podcast. And I just couldn't believe this. He said, Michael Jordan owes him an, a public apology for the way he was portrayed in The Last Dance, the Jordan biography. Um, I don't think that's coming anytime soon, Isaiah. I mean, can you see Michael Jordan apologizing to anyone for anything? He doesn't strike me like it's in his DNA to ever be wrong, right? Um, that's part of his pathology. It's also why he was so great, you know, um, a total assassin. Assassins are never wrong and assassins never apologize. So don't hold your breath, Isaiah. And by the way, you know, he was complaining about in the, in the documentary, they were calling Isaiah an asshole. By the way, seems to me that if the shoe fits. But, you know, at least Isaiah has gone on to a, a distinguished career as a NBA executive. No, that isn't what happened either. But neither is Jordan. So, both of them excelled on the court. Both of them did not excel in the corporate boardroom. Yeah, I'm still seeing Jordan shot in my nightmares back in 89. So, on that note, if you'd like to send an email, send it to veryoddcaster at gmail.com. That's veryoddcaster at gmail.com. We've got maybe one more episode left for this fall season of A Very Odd Caster. So, have a wonderful weekend, people, and we shall see you soon. Thank you.